<laughs> Hi there! Uh, <laughs> welcome to Composing Music for Games. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm Scott, and this is Steve Horowitz on my left. And uh, we're here to basically give you uh, a 5,000 foot view of what it means to compose music for games. Yes, yeah, so how many of you uh, in the room are mm, composers? Whoa! <laughs> Can I get a picture of you guys all raising your hands? Because <laughs> yeah, last year they told us that not enough people came to these things. Oh, you're not supposed to say that. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't to... say okay, wait, just raise your hands again like I just asked the question. That's awesome. A room of compo a giant room of composers. Okay, so here here is no one would believe it, right? Um, so here's a better question. Or, or not a better question. The next question is how many of you have um, written music for a game? Yeah. Wow. Cool. What kind of game was it? Yeah, How many people know what platform means? Oh, not bad. Okay. Uh, what, what was the name of the game? Splat! Look, look, look it up. Was it on Steam? Wow, so this is going to be a good session. It's going to go really, really quick. We have an hour, right? Or 45 minutes, 50 minutes. 50. So our whole goal will be to try and you know, bring you up to speed on as much as we know um, and what will be helpful to you guys in terms of what the environment like is like out there for scoring and composing for games. Um, you can help us out along the way by um, reading the slides so we don't have to give you our resume. <laughs> OK, that's helpful. Um, Secondly, uh, we'll thank the MPA and the Manhattan Producers Alliance. Um, and there's a West Coast chapter, which is up in San Francisco, of which I am a part. Um, so if you're more interested in the MPA, um, you know, feel free to come up after. We can give you more information about, about all of that. And there's a, there's a talk right after, another MPA talk. And we'll be giving one other game audio talk, which is actually, if you're into sound and music for games, at 5 o'clock. We're going to be doing a panel talk with Russell Brower, who is the audio director at Blizzard, uh, a game company some of you may have heard of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Gary Scheinman, the composer of Bioshock, a game you might have heard of. Uh, and his score for Bioshock in Infin Infinity is really amazing. Um, and Brandon Anderson, who is an uh, in-house composer at Disney Interactive. So we're going to be doing that at 5 o'clock, talking to those guys, because we've presented a couple times today, so we're going to let them give you all sorts of information about the business of games and, and complete the cycle. So um, the other way that you can help us is please ask questions along the way. I might not hold up your hand, or just let me know that you want to ask a question, and we'll try and get it in over the course of, 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 our, of our talk, because there's a lot to cover. Um, and we want to make sure it's as functional as possible for you guys. So, uh, first slide goes away. Yes. And we'll remind you. My role here. <laughs> um, we just want to remind you guys that we did write a book about audio for games, and music is a big part of that. Um, we have a copy up here. Unfortunately, I don't have a ton of copies. Vocal Press, who published it, may or may not be on the floor right now. I, I haven't had time to look yet. Um, so we have a flyer up here, if you're interested in it, there's a discount on the book, a 20% discount. And there are also some cards for an organization that Scott and I co-founded, which is the Game Audio Institute. Yes! And our whole mission with the Game Audio Institute is to help composers such as yourselves figure out why writing and composing music for games is different than writing music for film or television or scoring for your band. Um, or for um, different ensembles, or writing chamber music, and to create materials that will help you to actually write music and put it into a game, which is hard to do, right? Mostly, or not mostly, but I should say, a lot of game audio education is about, oh, here's the cutscene from God of War, why don't you score the music for that? Well, that's good, but that's like scoring a cartoon or scoring a film, right? Our whole philosophy is that if you really want to be a game composer, understand the difference between a game composer and a film composer, or, or, or a, a concert composer, um, then you need to be able to put your music into an actual game. So we have created custom game levels and curriculum that we started with the book, we teach at the Academy of Art University and also at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and we use these materials to train composers 
on different aspects of, of writing music for games. Um, so you can read that yep. up on the slide. Yep. Um, just a little of the website because we don't have uh, internet internet connection. Uh, you, can, you can keep going through these. And then just highlight then one more. We do like to highlight the work of our students. So if you don't go to the website, you'll see some of the people. And not just students, actually. Jerome uh, Rosen, who uh, uh, is one of the MPA composers, he wrote the score for the Happy Tree Friends. You guys may know that show. Um, he's actually giving the panel after us. He also worked with one of our levels and, and put a demo out there. So, and Brennan Anderson will be Brennan actually Anderson on the panel. Actually, back in the day when he was actually a student. Yep. Uh, so um, we work with a lot of different schools. These are some of the partner schools that we work with. And again, if you're interested, these materials are available to individuals, they're available to educators and schools. How many, do we have teachers in the room? How many teachers are in the room? Oh, wow. So if you're thinking of a game audio program at your school, if you're thinking that uh, music for games might be interesting, these could be interesting materials and you should check it out and we'd be happy to discuss it with you after uh, the panel or you can just check it out when you get a chance. Sure. So let's get to the heart of the matter, which is game. Uh, we're going to give you a quick overview, I'll let Scott do this, of just the market in general. And, you know, I think most of you kind of are aware that games are kind of a big business, so we'll go through this pretty quick. So yeah, we have a few little facts here, some of this information is somewhat old, but basically in 2007 they say the game industry has surpassed the film industry in terms of gross sales, hasn't looked bad since. Um, this, this includes hardware sales as well as game sales, whereas they're only including box office from the film industry, so it's not exactly a fair comparison. However, uh, the estimate of 82 billion or whatever like that by 2017 has been blown out of the water by the emergence of VR. It is now somewhere in the 90s at this point by 2017. Theoretically, um, the you, the one interesting thing about this is that the demographic uh, demographics have really changed considerably. You know, no longer is the gamer the totally anti-social person who sits in their mom's basement and has gigantic thumbs and stuff like that. You know, we met, we now have. Uh, almost a, a, uh, in casual games, we have an almost complete gender split. In fact, actually, I think now it's a slightly more in favor of women than men on casual games. Um, and you know, PC games, the average PC gamer is now considered to be 34 years old and has been playing for 12 years. So this is like an experienced person, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's going on. There's a lot of shifting tides, and sort of staying ahead of the game is a little bit uh, tricky. Um, this was basically some facts that were happening around the time the casual games were coming out. For example, at the time when Farmville was just blowing up, Singa actually got to be a net worth of almost as much as EA, actually, or, or larger, slightly larger than EA. That's no longer the case, but, uh, you know, uh, things constantly are changing in this industry, and it's helpful to sort of stay ahead of the game. Uh, we're going to move on ahead there. I don't know if I want to do this. Yeah, we'll, we'll tailor it. So there's, so there's a lot of platforms that happen. I mean, one of the most, uh, probably one of the reasons why you're even here, why there's even like a big explosion of this, has been the emergence of all of these extra platforms, all of these particular mobile devices. You know, Android's got about 80% of the market. Uh, Apple's got about 15, roughly. Um, and uh, but at the same time, the game situation with the App Store is a little bit, uh, or you know, a little bit more organized and. Uh, vetted, you know, so they actually keep in mind, you know, they try to make sure that things don't have viruses and stuff like that. So, you know, the uh, the gaming market for iOS devices is still going very, very strong. In fact, many of these companies that were making casual games, you know, that were on the web and browsers have now moved. They've either, like, completely gone out of business or they've moved all of their stuff to mobile, effectively. So these are the mobile platforms that are by far the largest. Uh, Windows phone is not anywhere near big enough. Um, let's see. And the platforms that we have, of course, are PCs, big with uh, especially the digital distribution through Steam and things like that. They have Android consoles, even regular consoles, of course, the, the the current generations that we have, and then also all kinds of extra devices like pinball machines, believe it or not, and uh, you know, uh, one arm bandits, you know, the the, uh, the uh, gambling machines, and also other kinds of hardware and toys. You know, that's in, those are other markets. You know, other types of platforms that happen. Um, I should also mention a little bit about the fact that Moore's Law means things get better and better and better. You get bigger voices and stuff like that, and you get more capabilities of the electronics. But at the same time, miniaturization is also happening. So let's take example of the iPhone. You had a situation where the PS2 comes out, it gives you 48 voices, then the Xbox comes out with 64 voices, the 360 comes out with 256 voices, and then the iPhone comes out and you're back to 32. 
So this kind of stuff happens a lot. For example, Guy Whitmore, who did the, the, the uh, he's one of our composers that we know very well, who's a really fantastic game composer, did the music for Peggle 2. He then had to make a uh, iOS version of this game that ran on an iPad. He had five megabytes of space to put all his music in. He got it ended under that. It's and like 3.5 megabytes. And that's an Xbox One title that, you know, was full orchestra record, you know, so interesting. Yeah, so these are challenges. The point, the point about this is the challenges, and the point for you guys as composers coming into, into game space is that tech is important, right? So just like you understand when you put a film into Pro Tools and you're moving it around and you understand how to lock that together, it's very important that you understand the history of game consoles, where you know the technology, how it evolved, right? And now how it's devolved in this circle that goes around because understanding the hardware, understanding the capability of the platform makes it possible for you to write music for a game that um, uh, has a completely different logic than another game, right? right? So again, all this stuff for composers, we're not going to tell you all this today. There's no way we can go through all this information. But hopefully what you'll get out of today is to think, oh yeah, tech, I should really look into that. Because, for example, um, HTML5, which Scott has up on the screen. Yeah. So this is basically uh, essentially something like having the kind of tech that you would associate with the DAW in your web browser. So you could literally do things like delays and reverbs and filters and real-time synthesis and signal convolution like vocoders and all kinds of stuff like that, all for games, positional audio, VR, whatever. All of this is available, you know, currently in browsers. It's, of course, very, you know, uneven in terms of how many platforms it runs on, comparatively speaking. But it's got a lot of promise, a lot of potential, and way better than, let's say, the days of Flash when you could make the sound like change in audio, and that was about it, pretty much. Right, and in terms of HTML5, what happened with Flash, so it's not supported on iOS devices, right? So HTML5 became the de facto standard, and the tools are still not all that great for HTML5. No. But if you're the type of person who can get in and do a little bit of research, um, find out what the capabilities of it are and how it can be used inside of a game platform, you know, you may be the first person who really actually understands it, right? At the beginning of mobile phones when they came out, when mobile came out, nobody knew how these things made sound, right? The first games, just like back in the day, were silent. So this is all opportunity for you. The, the, the big takeaway is that the tech side of games is a big opportunity for composers to, for you guys to apply your craft um, in another area of the industry, constantly evolving, constantly changing, and that change equals opportunity. Yeah, and if you can find the leading edge, then you can be one of the first people actually making music yeah. in that media, basically. Um, speaking of new media, VR and augmented reality. You got the Oculus Rift, you got Microsoft HoloLens, you got a bunch of different kinds of things going on, and uh, so that is a pretty awesome sort of situation, and I think has really expanded the possibilities of the game market, as well as establishing its own potential, completely different genre on, onto its own. Uh, it's still very much in its infancy, but it's a really, really awesome time to get into it, and learn as much as you possibly can about it. Uh, so, I think we're yeah. Main subject. So, you know, we like to talk about music and sound in games as the big three. We're going to concentrate on the one on the left or the right for you guys. No, left. Left. The dude with the guitar. Left. So we're really going to concentrate on, on music today. So we'll, we'll flip over to the next slide. Sure. So um, what's the difference? What's the difference between a game composer and a, and a film composer or a concert composer? And it kind of gets down to this idea of linear versus non-linear, right? So when you look up at the arrow and you're thinking about it, you know, you're working on a film, right? You put it in your DAW, it's the perfect bed. One minute, always at one minute on that timeline, you know, that's when, you know, the door is gonna close and the spooky music is gonna play and you're gonna construct the perfect queue of 48 tracks and protocols and it's gonna be great, right? It's gonna be awesome. And then once you do that, you can mix it all down, right? Because right. it's always gonna be the same every time you play bounce. In real time, or now in Pro Tools, bounce, you know, computer time, and your cue is done, and you can deliver it. Maybe you break out some stems, right? In games, we have to create those same experiences, except we don't know when that stuff's going to happen, right? Someone may go into a game, and they may never close, go into that room where that music is supposed to play. Um, and we've got hundreds or thousands of assets, which are actually 
in this case, music files, right? So maybe we're working on a game where we've got four levels of intensity, right? It's quiet at the beginning, and, it, and you want that to mimic in the gameplay, and you're gonna have to keep track of all those files, and you're gonna have to figure out when those files are gonna trigger, right? So it's a very different process, and it's a very different thought process as you put it together. It's an interesting challenge, right? How can I write a piece of music that can play against itself at any time, in any way, and be called, I don't know what the player's gonna do. Right? Yeah, for so, example, yeah, yeah, like for example, if you have theme A, I mean, can you go to theme G directly from theme A, you know, or then immediately go to theme C after that, you know, or, or, or what? You right. Know? So there's How lots of different that? possibilities. And the answer to that question has to do, so the nonlinear nature is the big 5,000 foot view, and the answer to that question is, what's the capabilities of the technology? What's the, what's the game logic of the game, right? So you right. ask a million questions and you start to uncover the possibilities. Right. Yeah. So then we have a, a sort of typical kind of buzzword in the, in the industry. We have interactive audio and adaptive audio. So uh, the way I basically put it is that interactive audio is push a button, get a sound. So in the case of uh, music would be walk into a room, get a theme. Walk into another room, get a different theme. Walk back into the first room, get that same first theme again. Right, so you have total control over when you're going to basically have this happen. Now, adaptive audio, on the other hand, is a little bit different. It's more like the, that, that the game structure is actually what's driving the changes, in this case, in the music. So maybe you have a situation where you went into room A, but you didn't have the key. So therefore, just a more ordinary room A music is gonna play. But then you find the key, and you go back to room A, now there's different music. So now there's a change. And you know, there was something that you could do in the game, but it's the, the game structure that's basically driving the situation. Now, the way I think about these is that basically these are two poles of a long continuum. So you can have music that is slightly interactive, or music that's not very interactive, or mostly adaptive. You know, any, anything in between uh, yeah. on that line. So I think it, it might be good at this time. We didn't do this in the last one, and I hope yeah. I included this slide. I did. So, oh, we don't have a web connection, right? We have no web connection. There's no internet. Not that no, I know no of. Internet. No, there is. There's, a, there's internet in here? Yeah. Let's see if we can get up and I'll, I'll elucidate a little bit. So, while you're, while you're trying to hook that up. So look. Is it that meeting room? Because uh, I'd love to play you this clip, which is a short clip about the making of the music for a game called Red Dead Redemption. Who's, who's seen it? Or who's played it? Okay. Uh, great Western uh, uh, theme genre. And they did a wonderful, they, 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 they used a wonderful, um, technique for creating an interactive soundtrack. Um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to actually view it in just See, a second. We have to wait for the negotiation. Yeah. So you're not connected. Any, any questions while we, have, while we have a second we're setting this up? Yes. What do you want to do? <laughs> Deal. That's a good question. Any, any questions about what we're discussing? Which one did you want to go through? Question here? I, I, I want to play the red dip clip. It's five minutes. That's a good question. What DAW? Digital Audio Workstation. So the question is, what digital audio workstation? I work exclusively with Pro Tools, okay? Uh, Scott's more of a Logic user. Yep. However, the interesting part is what happens after that. So have you heard of programs like FMOD or WISE? Yeah. Okay, these are pieces of audio middleware which we're going to talk to you about. But first let's look at this clip because what we've just talked about in terms of how to create a score that's interactive, this five minute clip will say it better than any, anything. That when setting out to create the music for Red Dead Redemption, the challenge was to exceed the high expectations fans have for the soundtracks and other Rockstar titles. Rockstar tipped their hat to the masters who created the Western music genre while re-envisioning it for the 21st century and making an original score that is interactive and changes based on what the player does. The goal was to complement the visually stunning game world with a score that is equally authentic. To achieve that goal and level of authenticity, Rockstar reached out to musicians that play traditional period instruments and utilized both digital and analog recording techniques. They brought on composers Woody Jackson and Bill Elm, who worked to show a respect for the past, but retool it for a modern medium. All the Westerns, we were always into that stuff. It was composers Morricone and Francis Lai and Bruno Nicolai. I think it's definitely finding a balance, paying homage to what's there, but also trying to add our own stamp to the music. Mm -hmm. 
and I love the music from all those old Clint Eastwood movies and all that stuff has been a huge influence on me and I've, I've loved that music forever. The team brought together top musicians to create an authentic Western experience. You know, a lot of sessions are like trying to serve a song, whereas with this, it's more like just kind of coming up with an emotion, but being a little more vague about it, trying to be somewhat background material, but engage the listener in an emotional level at the same time. Toco la trompeta. Y la quita el drum. Y la trompeta con la quita el drum. For the true sound of the West, Rockstar contacted harmonica legend Tommy Morgan, who has worked on classic Western soundtracks and TV shows for 60 years. For Bravo. Very fast for Bravo. Combination of those two give the unique spaghetti Western sound. Woody were especially creative about finding interesting sounds for the games. They searched high and low to find the perfect instruments and sounds. This is the guitar I used on most of it. It's an ugly guitar, but it makes a pretty sound. These are jaw harps, uh, and these are on the frontier. This is the one, you know. Searched and discovered instruments to have an authentic Western sound, the biggest challenge was finding a way of recording a score that could adapt according to decisions the player makes. So instead of songs, they composed stems. We had to devise a method by which those stems could be used practically anywhere in the game and interact with other stems. The team decided to create all the music at 130 beats per minute in A minor so that the game engine can play stems on top of one another and create music on the fly. If you jump on a horse, the bass line kicks in. When you start getting chased, timpanis roll in, and big fuzz guitars roll in, and there's a shootout. The music actually changes with the action. Getting the right combination of music and timing is essential to further connecting the player to the world that Rockstar created. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Rockstar for trying to create something that's innovative. It's a super cool project. Cool. All right, so, so look, I think that, that that's a really clear score of an example of an interactive score. I mean, and to the level and the depth that, that we're starting to see yeah. the scoring of these games. Now, what was interesting in that clip? We composed all the music at 130 beats per minute in A minor, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, it's a One great, mode, basically, it's right? a great so, example of the choices that you make. That's a creative choice based on the fact that that's perfect for the spaghetti western sound and that Morricone sound, and it really works within the game. So, these kinds of choices and these the ways to figure out these puzzles are what you'll be doing as a game composer. Um, and it is uh, super cool to try and figure out how to solve solve these puzzles. Now, I'd like to jump right to F, to the middleware if we could. Specifically, yeah. Puzzles or anything yeah. Like that? Okay. Yeah, we can go back. But you asked a question uh, about what DAW we use. So, when you're creating uh, your music for games, at the beginning, it's going to be very much the same as you're used to. You're going to use Pro Tools. You're going to use Logic. Some of you use Reason. Some of you use. Uh, uh, Reaper, some of you use uh, Sonar, some of you use Ableton, Ableton Reaper, uh, Digital Performer, that, Performer, Performer, there yeah, we Performer. go, Performer, yeah. <laughs> Cubase, Nuendo, all that stuff. <laughs> Lots of DAWs, more DAWs than ever before. And after you get done, that's when the rubber's going to hit the road, right? Once you've had that initial creation, and you saw that in the clip, where they got the instruments they wanted, they got the sound they wanted, they did, made the artistic decisions, now there's a bunch of extra stuff that has to be done. And this is where your mind as a game composer changes from your mind as a film or TV composer. And 
Um, why don't we jump, actually, so let's jump to the screen about, so there are, we'll talk about FMOD and Wise and what middleware, but you asked about, so the other programs that you should start to take a look at and start to look into are FMOD, Wise, Master Audio, and Fabric we had up there, and those are middleware. Um, and when we talk about audio middleware, there's lots of different middleware for games, right? A game engine does a lot of different things. Oh, wait, did you want to uh, No, 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 that's good, that's good. Um, and the middleware essentially aids you as a composer to be able to do some things that it would take a programmer to do, right? So it sits between you and the game engine itself and gives you a GUI. Does everyone know what a GUI is? Yeah. A graphical user interface. Pro Tools is a, has a GUI, right? That you we're used to with logic. So these, these uh, programs give you that GUI and allow you to do things that it would take a programmer to do. So I'll let, I'll let Scott go through this. Sure, so, so this is the old slash potentially new, depending on who you're working with. This is sort of like the old fashioned method. So right. the old fashioned method. Wait, just, just to interrupt you a little okay. bit. So workflow for games, we're very big on this. So it's, this is really essential to understanding, these two slides we're gonna go through, to understanding what that workflow really looks like. You know, because a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I wrote music for a game. Now you're getting a picture underneath the hood. What, it, what actually happens step by right. step. So remember we talked about how everything has to be separate. So the idea is that you are the audio person or the music composer or whatever, and you're talking to the programmer and you're communicating with them, and you have an asset list which has every single music cue that you're gonna put in here, including all the tail endings and beginnings and stuff like that, all laid out exactly as they're supposed to be with the sound files, specially formatted for the platform and everything like that and you give them to the programmer, they put that in the game, and what really happens is actually a little bit more of a circular processor. Oh, yeah, the programmer on the right-hand side is Corrine Yu, she wrote the Halo engine. Um, let's see, she works for 343 now. Um, or, see, Naughty Dog now, sorry, Naughty Dog. Um, anyway, so, uh, so basically what happens is that this process kind of, kind of goes into sort of a triangle back and forth. Once the programmer puts it into the game engine, they have a test build. You listen back to the test build. You determine whether there's any changes that have to be made with the producer or whatever or the people in the game. And eventually, if you get it right, then you know you can ship and you can have lunch. Um, but all right. So the thing about it is, is that in middleware, there's another. Uh, it's a sort of a better situation. What happens is that you get to work with a GUI or something fairly simple like that where you can basically drag and drop things or put in little text information or whatever like that. You don't actually have to program, but you do have to think about the behavior, in this case, of your music. Like, how is it going to behave in the game? And this, of course, is things that you talk to the programmer and the producer and stuff like that in the games, you know, determining how the structure of the game is going to drive how the music is going to go, basically. Then what you do is you sit there inside your middleware of choice, FMOD wise, whatever custom solution that can be in-house. Sometimes if you're in EA, they use their own custom engine called Frostbite. Um, so what happens is that basically, you know, you work whatever you want to have happen, and then you send them a build file plus the banks. And the programmer can then just put that in there directly into the game engine, and then of course that goes back and forth many, 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 many times, and then of course, once you're actually done, you can ship the game and it's success. Okay? But what happens in this case is that it just gives you much more control as a composer over what you want the music to do, you know, inside the game. And the cool thing about it is, is that FMOD and Wise and other types of middleware, not all of them, but most of the middleware packages that are out there are free to use. They're totally free to use, they're totally free to learn, there's lots of documentation and, and, and tutorials and things like that about it, um, and so, you know, it's really, it only happens that if the game company is, say, somebody like Rockstar and they make a ton of money, then basically they pay a license fee to the middleware company for release of the title. But basically. you can download the software, you can download, you can download, it, download it, FMOD, it you can download WISE, and there are tons of tutorials up on the web, and you can start to bring yourself up to speed. Now, did that help to answer your question? Yes. Okay, cool. another question here. All of them are working on. Yeah. Yeah. There's, well, a, there's a little bit of a situation with Wise in the sense that Wise is running under Wine, if you understand what Wine is. Okay. So there's some certain things that you can't do, but it's still pretty functional. You yeah. can't drag and drop as well as you could in some other things, but because of the fact that, let me think, these two plug into Unity, the game engine. So Fact one thing to know about is all, Unity, yeah. the game engine. Uh, FMOD and WISE will work in other kinds of situations, but they work on both Mac or PC or, or, or Linux for that matter, honestly. They'll, they'll work on, on everything. Yeah. So, any other good question in the back? How 
early are the composers or the music coming into play? That's a, that's that a, is a good question. That's point. a great question. So yeah. what I can tell you, so I, I'm the audio director for Nickelodeon Digital. So um, I get in at the beginning now, as early as I can. Like I want game design documents. I want stuff on paper before, so I can read it, so I can see what they're thinking about the logic of the game. Um, in certain situations, so, so it's always best if you can get in as early as possible. However, that won't always be the case. Many times, you will be asked to like, hey, can you write a bunch of music for this game? And you'll be like, cool, can I see it? And they're like, no. <laughs> That's hard, right? So, so then you start to ask questions like, well, what kind of game is it? You know, what kind of platform is it for? All these millions of questions you'll go through. And then you'll ask, can I see a screenshot? I mean, can you give me anything? So you try and get something. And there's been, there have been many times when I've written music for games where I do it off of a one image that they gave me or you know, a, a, you know, some animation that they put together, very small. So it, it, it's everything from getting into the beginning. It, 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 it's, that's, it's a big spectrum. Yeah. So then after that, do you end up getting involved with the change once you, they eventually become Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and over the years, I've become quite good at knowing when to insert myself in the process. Right? Because if I get in too early, then I'll end up redoing a bunch of work. And if I get in too late, then I'm staying up late nights to, to, to cram when I, when I shouldn't have to, right? So there, there becomes a time, as you do more game work, you start to understand where you should insert yourself in that process and, and when. Like, like, for example, if you're doing, and this is not music work, but if you're doing sound design work or if you're doing musical sound effects um, that are tied to animation specifically, I, won't do the, I will not do those unless I see the animation. Because I can, right? I've got another question. So, as Disney used to have like a group of animators, do <coughs> you see the future of here of being like a tin pan alley of of uh, composers that you know are working on different parts of pieces and bring it in? Interesting. So, like, for example, if you wanted. Me or this young lady or uh -huh. this person, you know, that, that, that is an interesting question. Up until fairly recently, it was usually the responsibility of the composer to do the music for the game, and it could be anything. It could literally be like heavy metal for one game, and orchestra music for the next game, and folk music for the next game, and the game composer would have to be good at every single one of those things. And I think to a greater or lesser degree, that's still the case. You get a wide variety of, of games. So if you really want to work in games, and you like writing a lot of different styles, you'll have more opportunity than if you write a single style. However, there is a guy who did the music for a game called Fez. His actual like name in the industry is a disaster piece, uh, Rich Freeland. He's awesome. He does really great music, but it's very, very stylistically specific uh, in, in like kind of an electrical, electronic kind of ambient genre. And it's kind of like that's his thing. Like that's what he wants to do. Is that he did a music for a horror film called It Follows. It's really, really beautiful, and it's very, very specific to his kind of sound. And I, and I think that potentially there's openings for that kind of thing. If you're really passionate about something, you don't just want to become the next Hans yeah. Zimmer. Yeah. You know, it's it's it's. Yeah. A, it's digital. Well, and the other answer to your question is it depends on the company too. So if you yeah. are working for Sony Interactive. They work with teams of composers and teams of integrators, right? right. So it's rare they'll have one composer on a title, right. right? They'll have sometimes many composers on a title. Whereas with smaller companies, it's usually one, you know. So bigger companies, you'll get teams of teams of writers well, who are composers. Teams, together. right? We have the, well, the teams of composers, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. in the larger game companies, you might have lots of different roles, right? Where you might have audio lead, you have sound designers, programmers, video producers, composers, all working at the same game company. It's be say larger game companies generally, right? But in other situations, you might be doing everything yourself, literally, you know, like absolutely everything. <laughs> so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna probably move on to show you guys uh, another example in a custom level and to show you, we have a couple of slides. Do you do anything about preparing your stuff? And um, I think we kind of talked about that. Okay. I think go to F, go to the FMOD screen. And do you guys have any more questions before we move on or should we keep going? Oh, you mean a volume standard? Yes. It's becoming that way. Um, they've got they've got like a new 
you know, they're, they're trying to move that, that direction for the AAA I, stuff, try, stuff specifically. Try. I mean, but, and, and, but it's, very, it's still very formative, so and there's still some holes and yeah. difficulties with it. If you, if you enjoy uh, standard practices and what's happening with volume, volume uh, standardization, that sort of thing in gaming, and then the Interactive yes, Audio yeah. Special Interest Group, we have a slide at the end of it, um, or Gang had a working group for a while. There are working groups out there that are trying to have the industry adopt volume standards, and it's been very difficult to get everybody to agree to one volume standard uh, to, uh, to master on. Just like, the, just like the music industry, these guys can't agree either. Yeah, um, last question will be, what your engineer is excited and we just work on yeah. 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 So, yeah. And there have been several recommendations in white papers that have been written in, you know, uh, in recommendation to the game industry, and it's it's, it's standard, these things are very very difficult to do these days, right? Yeah. Very very tough. I saw a question over here. It's often you guys really, uh, just talk about the sound. <laughs> um, all <laughs> constantly throughout the game. So. Did I hear what you got up there? Yeah, someone had played play Pac-Man, sounds good. Like. <laughs> that's okay. That's a ringtone. That's a ringtone, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's an insult. No, it's not. By far, by far. No, um, so, uh, constantly. So, you know, you'll start at the beginning, you'll work on the project, you'll work with the game designer, you know, you'll work with the producer. It's an iterative process, so you'll be in touch with them, things are going to change. You know, I find myself constantly with my phone on mute on conference calls where I really have nothing to say, but I'm listening to the producers so that I get to understand what's about to happen to the game and when it's going to change. Um, so as much as possible, you want to be involved in that cycle. You, game music, game production in general is a team sport. So as a composer, unfortunately what happened, composers used to be in-house like audio designers and sound designers and voiceover recording and editing, that used to be all in-house and the composer was a member of that team working at the company and got benefits and all that stuff. But over the years, the Hollywood model has kind of won out with the bigger studios and production, so they expect to contract composers into that. So as you work on games, I would highly recommend that you let them know that you'd like to be part of that. You want to be part of the team. It's like, even though they're like, well, we're not paying you for it necessarily. That's a, you know, if they know that you're interested in the game on that level, you'll get to dial yourself in uh, to the team and it'll, it'll lead to better results. So, I saw a question over here. Um, so what do you do about the, the repetition? Like, I think uh, at certain points in the game, I know that I just don't have time to mute because I figure something out. So what do you guys do about the, the repetition? Exactly. So, so that brings up, uh, we can actually jump to the, jump to yeah, the looping can. slide. So, so, so in games, what can we do as composers without a programmer, right? That's, that's the issue that you're bringing up. Why, when I listen to games, do I want to mute it or go crazy, you know, <clears> from hearing the same thing over and over again? Well, we have to depend on bread and butter for game composers is the loop. Absolutely. Because of indeterminacy. We don't know how long things are going to last. So, right? The other... So, so we have to create looping pieces of music, right? And then we, then we have to balance the use of that looping piece of music against what's capable on the game engine and then what's capable in the hardware. So, oh, I need to create a looping piece of music for a game and I'm going to be doing it for the iPhone and it has to be of a certain size and it has to, right, so, you, so now you're, you, that, this is all the technical considerations you start to weigh out, and then you ask yourself, well, how long will the player be in that area, right? So it may be in a lot of cases with the games that you're listening to that are driving you crazy that the composer might have been like, there's not enough music in this game, we need more. And the game de developers and the publisher might say, sorry, we don't have the space, we, we're gonna, we're going to do 10 levels of a, of, of, a pla of a platform game, and we want one piece of looping music for one minute. Or sometimes what happens is that they tested the game, and they didn't think that anybody was actually going to stay in that room that long. So they just didn't care. It's like, oh, we have 30 yeah. seconds. They're not going to be in that, that you know, so, for very long. So the, answer, the, uh, the true answer to your question is bad design work and bad planning. Right. right? And I'm not going to say bad composer, right, sure. because it might not be the composer's fault. Right? I don't want to say bad composer. But, um, but there's so many factors that go into it that sometimes, you know, it's happened to me as well. You know, I see it, I mean, you know that 
But at the end of the day, well, we created this game for one platform, and now we're down. We're going to port it to another, and we can't take all this. I mean, on some of the mobile platforms right now, it's very, it's 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 really like the back to the wild, wild west. And serious, you have to choose: do you want sound effects or do you want music? Right. Because in Android, you can't trigger both. Well, right? well, or, or timely. You know, in right. the case of you know, I mean, I definitely knew some people who were like, yeah, we couldn't get the sound effects to trigger when when people were pressing the thing, so we just eliminated the sound effects and only had music. Now this is yeah. a few years back, and Android's no, been no, working it, on that. it still happens now, but it still can happen yeah. these days. Yeah. So that's really the. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sort of that trade-off. Okay. So let's let's before before we have to go, so we got the ten minute warning. We're going to show you a project. Do you do uh huh. Um, and this is a, an interesting project that we, we developed, um, that we do with our students in our classes, and then also if you go on the Game Audio Institute site, you can find. So uh, I'll let Scott talk you through it, but the idea of this, pro of this is, it's one of my favorite levels. You're on an island, and there's one single parameter, and, and, and when I say parameter, you can start to think adaptive, right? That the, in some way, the game engine is going to control the unfolding of music and sound in this level. Right. Right. So um, we basically have virtual time in this level, and it's constantly going. You have no control over it whatsoever. And while the day progresses, the music is going to change based on the times of day, essentially. So right. you'll start out at midnight, then eventually you'll have dawn, and then you'll have the day music that kind of takes over from there, and then at some point you'll have sunset, and then you'll have some evening music, and then it'll get to be late evening, and then you'll just roll back over to midnight, and you'll start off the whole cycle over again. And At the what, same time, we'll also have some. Sorry, we'll also have some no, <laughs> some ambiences that will change depending on those times of day. So we'll have more right. insect sounds, a little bit more wind at night, and a little more like bird sounds and stuff like that. So, so, so if you were working on this project as a composer, you play through it and you look at the level, you get the feeling for these times, and the description that Scott just gave you lets you understand that there's a parameter involved, and then you'd ask questions about, well, you know, 24-hour cycle and how do I do the transitions and all that kind of stuff. So you get the opportunity to put all that together. And the FMOD session that you saw up there, was, that was a picture of FMOD. So you got an understanding. You would, you would create all your music in your DAW, uh, Pro Tools or Logic, and then you'd bounce all of that out granularly, and you'd name each one of those, and then you'd reconstruct it back in FMOD, like you saw, and then make all of that work, the fades and the crossfades and everything, which normally would be a programmer's job, right? They'd have to take it and put it in and program it in the engine, and then you export that, and hopefully it sounds okay. Yeah. So let's, let's see, let's, uh, Scott will take you through his island. Scott's island. So as we walk through, we're starting out with music. Pretty much you can't really do anything. You're not really, you know, there's no object to the game. You're just walking through. And eventually, what happens is, is that we'll get lighter and lighter. There's the moon going down. And there's the sun coming up. We have this loop, and I'm gradually like changing the mix of the music as those day as the day progresses. I'm adding more instruments. So if you imagine this like really like taking place over several more minutes, usually you know you could have a very pleasant thing working, even though you have a very simple series of loops that are going on at all times. Yeah, it's about a two-minute cycle or something. We didn't want to keep you here for 24 hours.
Okay. the final uh, sure. with the... So, <laughs> question. Oh yeah, absolutely, oh, yeah. absolutely. So if you were to go on the Game Audio Institute site and get this level, you could write your own music, you could put it into the level, and you would be mixing everything in FMOD, controlling it, you put it in the game, and then you'd be like, that doesn't sound like I thought it would. And then you'd go back to FMOD, and you'd rework it again, and you'd go back and forth several times. And it's, it's an iterative process. Absolutely. And, and the, the beauty of middleware is that you can do that mixing. Because what does it look like if you don't have FMOD? If you don't have FMOD, you have to take all those tracks, Give them to a programmer who may know nothing about music. And about 85% of the time, they don't know anything about music. And they'll put it into the game, or she'll put it into the game, and they'll program it, and then you'll hear it, and they'll be like, no, that doesn't sound good. And now, what do you do? Email. Oh, yes. hi. Yeah. Uh, just wanted you to lower one track by 10%. And then can, they're can like, you, can you what? Please, can you please make the music not yeah. cut off between the yeah. scenes? Why is it all broken, you know? right? And now you've, got to, now you've got to get, and maybe to answer your question about how much do I talk to the producers, so when I'm in a situation like that, I've got to give them really copious, very detailed notes, right? So that they can actually do what I, I would like them to do, right? So, um, uh, yeah, you do your own mixing, absolutely. Any other questions before we have to go? And then it was fixed to 24 hours. It's just that we speed up the cycle so it doesn't take 24 hours. It's a very nice island. It's very relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! No, no. no, no F mod no. merely just a facilitator. Yeah. In fact, F mod is much more accurate than the game engines themselves. The problems become in the game engines that they're not, they're, that they're not necessarily always uh, rigged for the highest quality or, the, or, or uh, integration of audio. So sometimes objects, if they're far away or closer, they get set at different levels. So mixes can all of a sudden get way off, and that has to do with programming environment. More, more than more than other things. Um, I just want to highlight this. We're getting the high side, and, and I think we're going to have to, to break this. But a um, couple of things. So a couple of organizations you should know about if you want to get more into composing for games. One is the Game Audio Network Guild, which was started by Tommy Tellerico. Um, a great resource where they have contracts and a forum, and you can find out all sorts of information. Um, other composers. It's a great starting point. Um, and a great community. They, they run the Gang Awards at, at, at the Game Developers Conference. Um, great great uh, resource to know about, just, you know, gang.org. Um, the IASIG, the Interactive Audio Special Interest Group, which deals with just the kinds of things that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, was volume, good volume. So the IASIG is a group of working um, uh, designers who specifically, uh, the IASIG, um, uh, uh, facilitates uh, communication between composers in the field and designers in the field with the companies that are making the tools. And then lastly, the IGBA, the International Game Developers Association, which also has an audio SIG and does lots of cool stuff. And I'm getting a <laughs> sign. So thank you guys so much. We'll be, we'll be back at 5 o'clock uh, in the room next door. And uh, come find us in the hallway. We're happy to keep talking to you guys. Any teachers or educators?